Welcome. Um, I'm Kyle DeCoyan. I'm the executive director of the Poetry Project. We are so thrilled to be with you tonight for This Is All That Matters, South Asian poets on diaspora, kith, material, and speech. Um, this is the first event I've been a part of in our new season at the Poetry Project, and it feels like a really good, auspicious, and bracing start. Um, before we get into tonight's readings, I do want to offer a few notes just to give us some sense of place. So joining me tonight from the Poetry Project are Maddie D'Angelo and Anna Kreinberg, and I'd like to thank both of them for making sure this event runs as smoothly and thoughtfully as possible, and hopefully without any malicious intrusion. Anna is going to drop a link for some Zoom FAQs into the chat. We'll keep this public chat open in case anyone wants to express accolades or admiration or just say hello. Your microphones are switched off for the time being and you're welcome to keep your video camera either on or off. Please just note that this event is being recorded. So if your camera is on, your face may be visible at some point in the archived video of this event. In the upper left corner of the Zoom screen, I also want to note that there's a link for live transcription through Otter AI, in case anyone may appreciate having access to that feature. We're doing our best to maintain safer space within this digital perimeter. And I'll ask Anna now to share with everyone our statement of safer space. If you do receive any unwanted private communications in the course of this event, please just chat anyone marked staff and we'll make sure to get it taken care of right away. If we were gathering tonight, as we have for 55 years in shared place as well as time, and as we're beginning to do again, we would be in the parish hall of St. Mark's Church. We are committed to continuously and critically engaging the history and future of our presence in this particular space. And as part of that, we would like to acknowledge that our venue, as well as the place I'm speaking from tonight, is built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the US, and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. We invite you to join us in this work from all of the different places where you are and are sharing another resource in the chat, a map through nativeland.ca, not as an endorsement of this resource's completeness, but as a starting place for those we hope might feel encouraged to consider in new ways the histories of the places where we are. We usually set up the chairs together and put them away together in the parish hall at St. Mark's. And I find that even as we gather in these more remote grids, our community is still finding ways to make and hold special listening space together. So thank you for being with us and for figuring it out with us. We've made all of these online programs free and we've also continued to pay poets and artists for their readings, performances, teaching and writing. So if you feel moved to offer your support for this work, and is placing a link to donate in the chat. Part of the occasion for our gathering tonight is the recent publication of Divya Victor's Curb with Nightboat, an indelible book that's radiant with both resilience and attention, maybe especially in the work's engagement with architectures of violence, specifically the persistent volatilities of white fear and propriety and the ways these forces inflict particular harm on the many people of many South Asian diasporas. I want to thank Nightboat for coming to us and working with us on the beautiful opportunity of this event. I also would like to thank the Just Futures program of the Mellon Foundation, which has supported this program. I especially would like to thank Divya Victor for the generosity of her poetry, but also for her vision and warmth in calling us to this gathering of poets and artists from different South Asian diasporic experiences. And I'm deeply grateful too, to our whole group of readers, Aditi Machado, Pragita Sharma, 
Serena Chopra, and Kamala Mackerel, who will read in that order with Divya Victor before we conclude with a brief open conversation. And for that, we really do hope folks in the audience will feel encouraged to offer contributions and questions. Each of the readers will share briefly from their own work, as well as the work of someone else within this reading, and we will be sharing book sale links in the chat during each reading. While it's not possible to circumscribe tonight's poets inside a litany of inquiries, I do observe and feel deeply their different intuitions to Kith, to the intertextual, the migratory, the inherited, the studied and adapted. I think of how these crossings form a fabric and how that lyric material is both contextualized and liberated in relation to exchange. It's really special to have this time with poets whose ardor for one another feels so true. So thank you to our readers and our listeners for being with us. And I'm going to turn to our first reading from Aditi Machado. Hello, wonderful people. Um, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you to the Poetry Project and especially to Kyle and Vivia for setting up this occasion and really also for the feeling through of the occasion in advance of it, all the preparation toward it, the emails. Um, I'm just so happy and so ready to be reading with you, Vivia, Pragita, Kama, Serena, uh, with all of the beautiful A and vowel names. <laughs> and then there's me, Aditi. Um, I'm going to start by reading a poem by Serena Chopra. And it is from this very excellent book called Ick that um, I, in addition to just loving it, I've also had the privilege of talking to Serena about it for like these three intense hours <laughs> in a library room, which, um, was a wonderful challenge to transcribe. And it um, then it appeared in Jacket 2. And the reason that that happened is because Divya put us together and again, gave us this occasion to converse. And I think that's perhaps another instance of what she calls kidship. So this poem um, is on page 55 of Ick and it goes, from our home, we've come so far from our usiousness, we are more usic than ever. We read a manifesto in black letters, a white sign, sidewalk closed. A mythic wax, bring it up and in, weather like vain. Away, 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 now we owe what we yearn. Who could lose their skin and still own it all? Who would lose their skin and still owe it all? To wax ick, the city drives heat, scribes heat, fog light, attending to the gesture, what mimics us, buys us enough to keep peace by plastic peace in the chemical weather of muscle memory. Now I'll read one of my own poems, uh, which is called Rhapsody and is from a book called Emporium. Um, it is a long poem and I'm just gonna read all the way through. Uh, a couple of times you'll hear uh, these two uh, non-English words, ras and rasa, which I put in the chat. They are from Hindi and Kannada respectively to languages I grew up uh, learning and kind of sort of speaking and forgetting and learning again. And they both sound like, sort of like ras, rasa, and they mean juice. Rhapsody. Let us exercise our vocal cords. Let us draw them out, limbs. Let us say there is always a longer or shorter tress, always congruities, blissful, bitter rhythms, 
sprung onions splitting, violins in harmony that is harmonic, chaos that is chaotic, incense that is sensible, in here it inheres, out there rapid rabbits. Let us labor under these notions as under the Cantus Planus factory one. Let us stumble around, humming, stumbling, humming. Then something in the shape of leaves, something in the touching of red. Is it subversive? Let us hesitate with red. Let us feel it out with the feeling which we are. It is a panic in the full field. This outward loping, is it making it? Is it filling it? Is it making it explicit? A kind of horror at tubers, a tipping against as though I against Clement Green appears symmetrical from way off in the distance I devise. Do you know this desire? It's a bit like leaning into something. Sometimes experience is like that, nutritional. The thing is, I'm developing an accent. I don't like it. I try to narrow it. I hesitate. I try to sing it. I hesitate. Everyone is about to kneel, Pyrrhic. I mean, the congressional tune, it seduces my agnostic body. So I'm a little late to it, but I'm there. I get the bells orchestrate law. I get the centaurs are asters. Their conglomeration awaits our Easter gathering. Sunlight comes through the heightened bulbous assemblage. In a second, I'll commune, but there is in me a little antinomian flecked desire. So I hesitate a second, then go out with them into quite the sunlight spreading sort of around very lackadaisical, very like a floral spigot. Someone opens the countryside that opens the oral against the church on the hill to which the faithful voluptuously turn, which if they lose, to what will they genuflect? A deck built slowly of atheism in the moss induced decoalescing sonic purpose someone decolonized? It's like innocence, way off in the distance, distorted. I don't believe in lapsing, but it's like that. Like I'm shifting out of one desire into another asynchronous. And the things that carry me back do not carry me back whole. I try to rest in the depressions, landscapes under duress, as by eros eroded the guttural rose, roses springing forms familiar and foreign, thorns iambic, limbic, the rose, it does not flatten out. And broken lies the golden box spilling rus, rus, filling it rus, rus, making it explicit, rust rings it. And says Donatus, the stem is air stricken sensible to ears insofar as their power to hear is. Wistfully, I say, each stem is wrought from the clipping and the air is stricken with it and is worked into a stem. The stem is conspicuous or it is fuzzy. It is conspicuous when with meaning it is clipped. I herald those weapons, I herald that man. It is fuzzy when without it is. Cows lowing, horses neighing, hounds hounding, trees bristling, etc. Alfred, let us make it lovely again. Let us make gardens and lakes a variorum of some eternal paranomasiac, some perfect paradigmatic, perfect paradise. Let us stumble around this place that's humming, humming, counting the stems and the howling, hollering, the refrains, oh, the terrible refrains. We're in a musical. Thinking, rhapsody or rhubarb. Scant difference between some flowers and the heads of cauliflowers, the fingers get herbaceous, rubbing against. If I could get ecstatic, I would by the low soft weeds, the hard oracular orifices of tree bark. Some landscapes under duress predict this atonal sky. 
scant difference between flowers. The canned cool metal slightly curves of trash receptacles, meadow interregna, strange fanciful flights toward toward where the rhubarb field is not so bright red as you would think, not so precise or fulminating, too much green sticks out, stems and leaves like a fuzz of voices, watery incarnadine. Here, where the sounds so simplify the milia into that wetness there, here I stumble to approximate the durations of others, to appear of the same time as though of space, I worry terribly, I hesitate, I lose my measure. A juice trickles down my side, rus, rus, like I get I'm out of tune. Let us think. In the speaking of it, it eludes. Is it a lark? It fills it, it makes it explicit. It does not flatten out. Is it just spin? Like origins, tender regress, celestial problem. I like the smith. Something somethings. Purified something exerts pressure on the sometimes vital organs. Some systems proffer all vowels alliterate and in all prose a prosody. I think proclivities by which ordinary speech becomes vibratory pollinate such system systems. I'm only looking for a little homophony, others, honey. Ever since the accent, I find my mouth in places unforeseen. I'm given to the understanding of others. It's not futile, but it is strange in the dark to speak the dark rolling, the gilded vowels, the stars of blood catching on the danky trussed trees. Against my nature stand all possible drones, origins, sovereigns, oranges. For in the beginning, there was a sound, and the sound was good. I licked it. It made sense. I milked it. But you see, the war unsettled it. A clean historical break right down the landing strip of it. I licked it. Something in the shape of it, something in the touching of it. The music went out of it, and my desire for it, a widening gyre. Liar, you sense it? We lost our measure. I licked it, this myth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi. I loved seeing all of the heart reactions go up when you got to, and the sound was good. There was just like this explosion of love and appreciation from folks. Um, the next reader is going to be Pragita Sharma. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I just want to just also first, I'm in Claremont, California, and I want to acknowledge the ancestral land of the Gabriel, Gabrielino and Tongva people. And um, just, and also um, in, yeah, I just want to acknowledge this space and um, I want to thank the Poetry Project. Um, just I, I was I'm I'm moved by this community, and I was just thinking back to 25 years ago um, finding the Poetry Project, and I I just couldn't imagine um, the community we have before us right now. Um, it it was the avant garde community um, was very white, and so I just you know would wish to um, kind of find my avant-garde South Asian community. And it's here um, uh, through Divya and Kyle and the Poetry Project and also to celebrate Divya's book. Um, I'm just, um, I, yeah, I know I have to read poetry and I'm so moved right now. So I have to switch gears here, but um, just so grateful to be here. Um, so grateful to read with Kama, Aditi, Serena and Divya. So thank you for that. I'm going to start with Aditi's um, poem, Torso, from Some Beheadings. I just love thinking about how you move through the cere cerebral and the lyric, Aditi, and I just love sitting in there. So I'll start this. I've been lying here under a meniscus. Beside me, there have been some 
burials. I've been asked to think and I do and I refuse to be for the moment. I assume a perfection of time that displaces my whole sense, by which I mean my whole intellect, so I can look upward and I say I have been lying here under a meniscus. I've been lying under some burials and I think what have I been asked to do is say where the future is, as if it were hidden like calculus from everyone but the elect. You turn your eyes to the past as a figure. You turn your eyes to the future. Time is tense in speech, or how I speak to you is tense as you lie farther away from me than sound can carry. I cannot tell you which side of the meniscus I've been on, but I have lived, but I have lived as a way of saying something ceased. The dead ones, because I believe them, lie for me, and the grass that grows above them billows and the weeds are weeds I would bind myself in. The future is full of suspense and here is the banal. Every thought I think billows and the weeds continue. So where am I but always moving into the prophecy a second ahead? I cannot tell which side I'm on. Do I, am I filtrate? I turn my eyes, meniscus turn. Been lying here too long. My torso hums a lowly plane. The waveform reads the tree. Such a beautiful poem. <laughs> and I just uh, just love the intensity, what we move in and out of there. Um, I'm gonna just, I think I'm gonna read um, uh, five poems. Um, I'm gonna read one love poem from Grief Sequence, which sounds, <laughs> sounds funny to say that, um, but I'm, I'm having a commitment ceremony on Saturday to my partner, Mike Stussy, and I wanna read a love poem. And we're actually starting, we're gonna do our, dan our first dance with a song in the poem um, by Delphonics, Didn't I Blow Your Mind This Time, which he thinks the lyrics actually don't match the title and he's right. Um, so you don't have to really listen to the lyrics. You can just enjoy the emphatic intention of the, of the song. Um, Abide. You've gone to get a haircut in Kirkland, but before you left, you rubbed my arms to warm them out of the blankets with a dearness that I thought I would never find. When you grow older and I fret that you too will die, you will tell me that I conflate the stars with tombs. I sang you earth, wind and fire's reasons and we folded into the Delphonics, didn't I blow your mind this time? And I said, you don't even know you did. You are too modest to even think you could. And you know somewhere hidden, we live now to solve our soft hearts problems. Which can fall in places where they are the raconteurs who died on us. They took up the largesse of the art of death, but we don't care who had the better lover, the better spouse, the kinder or more considerate one. Now we can just take this morning and stretch out a line of aquaria, an aphoristic single-sided horizon of trees, buildings and sky. So I'm just going to read um, four poems. Um, they're all from this new book I'm working on called One Mint One. And it's One Mint, um, O-N-E-M-E-N-T, and then W-O-N. It was inspired after Barnett Newman's One Mint series. This first poem, I've actually read at the Poetry Project a long time ago, and it's, it actually found a home in this book. Um, so I'll start with it. A legacy. All this noisy commotion isolated a fairly small universe of nothing special. I had faced the assistant to the incumbent, his failed face of poetry bottomless with self pride and a satisfaction that fed his wolf. And he was a wolf. And when I scoffed at him with some penetration, I could see the clamor of his wounds, but also the vanity in his recognitions. He believed I was undeserving and thought it his right to judge. And his judgment, a stun gun, took my gender and race and euthanized its center. And he thought this was an extension of the occult, that it was the intuition of a bright star affecting forward. I wanted him to see this in a particular light, 
but the particular worsened into a bruise of matter far more inhumane. And I fell into its hole and he with his glee had no idea because his gender and race gave him the privilege to look down and see how my skeleton warped my will, but not the firmament of my broadness and what I know now as measuring across power and enduring many luminary deficits that come out of symptoms and their fallen edges. Metaphorically charged. I meant well and resisted comparisons for a while because those who might cajole me into finding their inaccuracy accurate need likenesses. I was meant to find myself inside a metaphor, but I wasn't there and felt disillusioned. Instead, I built the word with the bricks of what comparison might mean with another suffix. What I meant was I was keen to add nouns. I wanted to add wound to the comparison and build its condition to be matter of fact. I found the condition of the wound to be built into its state of cruelty. She said they have wounds too, and that's why they feel this way. I said, I'm not trying to wound them, but they like thinking of my wounds in a certain way. I find their wounds to affect cruelty and mine did not intend the same effect. I'm angry at those who have been economical about what I might have meant. I'm despairing because I created meaning from a grievance nobody dared to own. They wanted the grievance to be possessed after it was vetted and I didn't want to give it to them. And then they lied about what they thought of comparisons, which are metaphors lying about what they said they mean. And I'm just gonna read two more poems. And this one, um, yeah, uh, I guess it doesn't matter what <laughs> I was gonna say. Just to, this one started this, the, I, I was able to imagine this book from this poem. A one one. In it, I found that the political discourse would love its ethical moon, a wonderment, a one sum, bewitching affinities built upon antinomies abstract an expression, a wool cap of ornament for the sake of weather. Loving him helpless anew helped, loving her helplessly anew helped, leaving it all behind helplessly helped. Building around the moribund became a kind of blessing. I left constituents around the number one and I won and I felt simple or glad or finally incandescent and comfortably large in my honesty a kind of hanging of the rituals, the clothes, the sense of living in them upright. I felt trouble in the muscles, but I ignored the throb. I looked out and out into a dense and driven fog and said goodbye to its flavor. I said goodbye to more than 10 years of saying, will you please love me? I wanted to birth a kind of abstract expressionism of the merely objective and the racialized lover of things. One mint or ornament, or I won an ornament, or I loved an ornament, and the ornament of myself resolved, and the one mint of myself resolved. I resolved, and thus I became into myself a one that I thought would never be allowed. And I moved outside of the fog into a place that signified art. My dad and I have a lot of talks about that poem because um, he's helping me think about the oneness and the Upanishads and what I wanna do with the book related to, to that. This last poem is for, is for Mike. Um, uh, he was diagnosed recently with a, with a really rare cancer. Um, and so we've been working through treatments right now. And I'm ending on this poem. <laughs> Keeping still. How do you share what is possible when the impossible diagnosis weighs on us each morning? I try to undo a certain sadness because right now the chemo is working and we never know when it will stop or worsen. And so sadness I know will turn into despair. My mantra is to keep them far apart in separate aisles on opposite sides of conjuring. One can't let out, one can't get let out and the other lets herself in without my realizing. On Mondays, our reprieve is a joint appointment, 
we see Rachel, our acupuncturist, who lets us sprawl on our tables, a dividing wall that does not reach the ceiling. So we listen to each other being treated, being cared for, being touched. We're deciding what to leave of our ailments and which ones will insurance avow when they have not accepted cholangiocarcinoma and treating chemotherapy side effects, but they approve my ankle sprain. How deeply offensive, I think, how ableist, how we fall asleep for the hour and there's epiphany in there trying to dream itself out of our worry zones. What pinpricks hurt or sting, but perhaps distract? I hear you snore and I wonder if I join you and we are here to be a chorus, something we create unconsciously to have above our paper sheets, a kind of liberty the soul might share with the body, resting and unresting with momentary heaps. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much for the openness and invitations of those poems, Pragita. Um, our next reader is Serena Chopra. Hi, everybody. Um, again, I'm so grateful to be here. Like everyone has already. Um, okay, or am I? I'm seeing some funny looks. Am I okay? Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Which one second? Actually, can our next reader go? I'm having some issues right now. Is that possible? I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think that's no problem at all. Um, we can have a reading from Kama La Mackerel, and then we'll come back to Serena. Uh... I invoke our mothers, our grandmothers, and our femme ancestries. I invoke the teachers, healers, mentors, caregivers, and warrior women of history. I invoke Femmes of all genders, bloods, ages, lineages, generations of witches and fighters who infuse the universe with love, rage, and magic. I invoke the dynasties of femmes who gouged the earth from their bare hands and planted roots from the seeds of their hunger. The bloodlines of women and femmes whose bodies are steep with the darkness of the Kalapani, whose spirits are awash with the cleansing light of the full moon. I invoke my great grandmothers whose unknowing bodies stormed on a ship from the continent to the island, hands tied, bodies battered, minds resilient. I invoke the deities who never made it to the shores, their copper flesh and offering to the creatures that live along the edge of the unknown, where ocean becomes sky and sky becomes ocean. I invoke the generations who suffered, who died, who lived, who fought, who resisted patriarchy and colonialism on sugarcane plantations. I honor my mother, Vimala Devi, 
nurse, caregiver, teacher, mentor, inspiration and embodiment of femme power. I honor her mother, Dana Pakyon, whose fortitude knew no bounds, whose story remains untold, repressed, forgotten, chained, chained, chained to the silence of history. I honor Rita, whose womb carried shapes of born and unborn children, brave mother who offered her milk and blood to quench the unconsolable longing of the aching land. I honor Katai, woman of rose water, saffron, better leaves and nuts, whose rugged feet walked earth, sand, basalt and burning corn. I honor Kamala, whose ceremonial fingers enchant the dead and bring their spirits back to life. Uma, whose visions speak in femme tongues long forgotten. Lalita, whose salt flows like rivers longing for a sea to call home. Asha, whose ancestral lungs carry curses that quiver like crackles of burning sandalwood. Devika, whose grief is cavernous, like a sinuous passage in the night sky. And I invoke, I invoke, I invoke. Strength and wisdom from Goddess Kalima, Redeemer of the universe, Goddess of time, chained and destruction, Goddess with charcoal eyes and blood tongue, who cuts patriarchy and wears it as a garland around her neck, Goddess with matted hair and ivory fangs, who dismembers misogyny and wraps it as a skirt around her waist. That lineage, past, present, and future, the women and femmes who reshape the universe, I invoke and I honor. So hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I <laughs> think myself a little bit in this moment. Um, this this was the opening the opening piece from Zomfam, which is my debut co poetry collection, um, which came out from Metonymy Press, which is a local queer publishing house. This here in Montreal. Um, so I'm coming to you. Montreal, the city is known for Ganyagehaga in the language of the Ganyagehaga, who are the traditional uh, keepers of those territories uh, as the Jage, and, and for long has been a, 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 a meeting place for both uh, multiple indigenous communities. And it is um, such an honor and a privilege for me to be able to live in those territories. Um, I'm going to move on now and uh, I'm going to read an excerpt from Devia's Keith, uh, <laughs> which has been such, such, such an influential and, and such a deep, like, like yeah, it, it, it's a book that has really shaped both my life, my physical world, and, and also my own literary practice. Uh, and I'm going to read some excerpt, uh, a couple of the pieces from Salt, a Salt piece in there, and then I'm going to go back to reading uh, a Salt piece from Zofan. Salt. It grows from the ground, water, saltier than sea, saltier than sweat. It grows when the sun beats down, turns earth to salt, turns sweat to rupees. It grows from the ground, fields of white, funeral flowers, 
for the ones who harvest them. Salt, the crease between pit and arm, rings damp on a hundred dark boughs swinging in the bus going home. They were going home to wash salt from the words you had given them in exchange for their word. They were eating salt from the earth, earning salt from their brows, taking salt back on their backs. Look at them, Amma. Here, they have gathered. Looking back, at look at them, Appa, there. Their hands marked on each palm, their own names, written in salt. Anna, Appa, they have scattered in the sand. Look at them before the sea comes back. Salt, your body cannot make salt. It must be offered to you and taken into your body, through your mouth, and into your life, so you can live. It is a kind of keef. Oh, <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> um, so this was some of the salt pieces from Keith. It, it's so emotional to actually read this out loud. Uh, thank you, Divya. Um, oh. Um, and yeah, this, this entire part with salt, actually, specifically in this book, was so influential for me in the ways in which I was thinking of salt. I, I, even as a performer, I've been working with salt materially for many, many years, and, and salt is in the ocean. And uh, I, my connection to South Asia is via Mauritius. I'm a, a great grandchild of, of the indenture. Um, so, so my connection to South Asia is very much for salt and for the ocean. Um, so I'm going to read you a, a small excerpt now from uh, Zumpham, um, another excerpt from, from Zumpham. This is from the piece, Your Body is the Ocean. So make friends with your bones. Soak them overnight in coconut oil. Wrap them in banana leaves and polish them under the moonlight. Rub salt inside of your pores and crust the cracks in your skin, your scars and imperfections, dried fruit crystallized on a copper platter yielded to soya for preservation. Offer your earthy armor to the open skies. Let the burn of salt purify your pain. The rawness of tears purge your wounds. The churn of waves cleanse your island body. Big mountains with the edges of your hip bones. Sculpt temples from the softness of your lips. Make homes for the sacredness of your stories. Your body is home. Your body is an island. Nobody is home. Your body is the ocean. This was the Your Body is the Ocean from Zonfam. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me and such a delight to share space with all of you. And I look forward to our discussions. Thank you for such an embodied and embodying performance. Thank you. It was so generous. Um, I think Serena is back. So I'm hoping we might be able to hear from Serena Chopra next.
Hi. Everyone, so sorry for that. Um, I'm back. Um, Kama, amazing, amazing work. I, I love following your performances and your, your energy just to hear it live in this space. And uh, it's just so incredible. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for your incredible reading so far. And Aditi, for the beautiful reading of that poem from Ick. Um, I couldn't have read it better. Um, tonight, I am really blessed to read a poem from Pragita, which is right here. And I'm going to open with this piece. And this piece for me just really resonated with, um, I think, an experience that maybe all of us um, reading tonight have had and have written about in our poems. And um, this is a poem that hangs in my memory oftentimes as I write. And so I wanted to share it with you all tonight. It's called On Immigration. Um, you can find it on the Poetry Foundation, and it is from Pragita's book, Infamous Landscapes. On Immigration. After being humiliated, one continues the manuscript of identity, activities, diseases, doldrums, the crony affair after the situation. The one where one faces how one is the undertaste, how one isn't the neighbor, the pie baker, a white folk, how one isn't a gorgeous dream wrapped in tireless affection, crimped for wider screens. So there one grew in the coffee sickness, the dictionary browsing in a fury for the word entitlement to spill. After convulsing with rage, one continues in the aftermath of no friends on Tuesdays or shouting fiercely when nothing sobered to the 11th hour and the tide shrunk to its sense of privacy where it had nothing to do with shores or moons and the humiliation sat on its lover's knee, gathering the eccentric rich and the hourglass with such force, the rage enameled like fine paint to a sheen deep. Blue. Restless in the way that stirs the crowd to its feet to claim the encounter for the intentions of personal gain without the empire, without the embarrassment of shaking one's head, of resting it underneath the ground to lives sanctioned in the migrancy with an ugly plate for the economy, but working ever so hard so unplanned, so beyond what one did before the lack of dignity sang an opera and organized all the ideas before rage shot a bird that had once watched effortlessly all the comings and goings. And now I'm going to move into some work from a manuscript I've been working on called Daiwathi of Mercy. Um, this is a manuscript um, that maybe some of you have heard me read from before, but it is um, a sort of fam family memoir. It's about um, lineages of domestic violence in my family. Um, I'm tracing from my grandmother who was married at 14 in Punjab and then um, into a, a violent home where, in which she experienced um, you know, brutal um, beatings and was her firstborn child was taken from her. Um, and my father witnessed that violence. Um, and then the book moves into growing up with my father who both witnessed the violence and also experienced the violence of racism. So this sort of like national violence um, and how that leaked into our own home. And so the section I'm gonna read from tonight is um, about his childhood, a memory of his childhood um, that he tells frequently in which um, his father got mad and drunk and um, was chasing him around the house and he locked him, my father locked himself in a bedroom and he's a young child at this age and my grandfather lit the house on fire to um, murder him essentially. And so this is a portion of the book that deals with that memory and begins to pair it alongside memories I have of my own father's um, uh, violence, violence and violent tendencies. So this section of the book is called Debt Occasions, a, Plary, a Prairie Lamentation. 
When he was nine, my father woke in a field to the crack and holler of the other boys already at their cricket. Like other boys, my father loved cricket. My father laughs to remember the smoke stutters, the root stutter, the rain stutters in the grass. Like my father, I grew up listening to tall grass. I grew up a dark daughter with a dark father along a dry riverbed on an ever expanding construction site, playing house in unfinished homes, plucking milkweed from their plumbing, creeping through their skeletons, collecting rusty artifacts. I was determined to unearth an object of history, a fossil, an arrowhead, but all I found was bits of failed construction. On the Great Plains, my father and I built a garden of prosperous mint and failed artichoke and a lawn full of invasive species. From our kitchen window, I watched miles of prairie cut into concrete foundations. In the heat of construction, the wind stuttering, coyotes withering, I traced the uneasy poetry of building home. Like my father, I grew up listening to tall grass, fading into sight, a run-on sentence, depletion by expansion, in which intention alone never yields. After image of prairie, waking in concrete cracks, sites of injury where the failed heart blooms from the choke. Home is where Oh, darkness, thin mania. Remember the anger jumping like laughter. Don't abandon the after image of tile hived floor. Ghost paisley across your father's face. What kind of memory? Oh, if the poem is an occasion, is this the occasion? Once I came upon a doe curled in the crease of tall grass, dark eyes bulged and buoyed like a lump in my throat. When I cupped my hands over my mouth, his eyes lightened and pressed at me like the caesura draining between my palms. The smoke stutters, the roots stutter, the rain stutters in the grass the cobra tracking patiently for weeks its prey can see nothing else. I fall easily into the poetry of brown eyes, the amber ache of the shade that most affects me calls itself long looking suffered heat, named after the flight my father made into a foggy Maharashtra night named after the flames dimming in his irises as he hid, peering back in the grass. Whose fracture, whose fault, peering back where home was on fire. Where was home, where the fire? Peering back at the blackness swelled the pupil. Could he tell? Was the fiery diminishment due the servants hurling buckets of water? Could he hear them still, or was it really so great a distance in which he found himself settling like an ember into the grass? Never peer back at the emptiness stiffening, at the trace of event abandoning you. My father laughs through remembering, telling us the times his father and I feel guilty for ever remembering, for even thinking of the times, my father, all kinds of crazy times possess us, I guess. I rattle with alarm. I chew memory, spit. Later in the car, my wife, devastated in the after image of his memories, mourns, celebrates. How incredible it is you came to be, meaning, how many times before my conception, my father nearly, and how even before his conception, his mother nearly always was, how close to dying we master our love. When awakened in a field, when abandoned with looking back, stutters in the grass, 
when on the great plain edge of devastation, the doe in his little patch of prairie grass curled close to the hectic road. When where is his mother? When for safety his mother, eyes tracking my scent, falling all around her doe. Stutters in the grass, before awakened in a field, before abandoned with looking back, before awakened in a field, when ball cracked at the bat, before a dream compressed, boiled in your ears, before knotted in throat, what kind of abandoned years, before a father heavy in mind and fist, before what kind of narcotic night will let this child slip before into sleep, before the darkness thinning thinned, before your pupils punctured black, when peering back, when the smoke clears before it's oh, when the smoke clears before it's over, before the emptiness stiffens with abandon, before the smoke ghosted, before where, before when was the burning, before in the distance, before buckets of water, before the servants yelling for water, before you like an ember settle, before you like an ember settling, before in the tall grass smelling like smoke, before asthmatic and shaking and smelling like burning, when out of breath, before running out of breath, when running you are running, and when, when this, when is this real, when the house is burning, when it is really real, when is the ground and the land landing, when anywhere but near where, when a father laughing and running, because when from the garden wall should you jump, when watching the fire pray on and on, when servants scatter for water, when where is your father, when the second story is on fire, when the servants are yelling for you for water, when you mount the wall, when your gardener lifts you, when you are small, when you need a mount, when you need to mount the wall, when you look, you are falling, when falling, wake up, when you are falling, when like the fire spitting, you jump, when from the second story window, when should you follow the smoke out the window, when and shh, when and should you jump, when two stories up, when locked in a room filling with smoke, when the servants start yelling, when flames are spitting and you've locked yourself in, when from the, under the door the fire prays, when what heat praying on and on you, when you've locked yourself behind a roaring door, when twisting the hot key before the door roars, before father laughs, before he tosses the mat, before he tosses the match, before he laughs, before he spits fire, before the servant douses the door, before the servant is hit, because when the servant objects, when your father commands him, toss the gasoline, before he calls the servant and gasoline, before his anger is jumping like laughter, like fire, before the door shakes, before he pounds the door, before he is spitting fire, when you can't under, when you can't understand his anger, before you back away from the door, when you listen for, when you shake the key, the lock in its place, before the lock punctures punctuates its place, when you shake the lock into place, when you slam the door and shake, when you can't understand his anger, when the shards scatter, when he is chasing you with laughter, puncturing the mirrors, when you run, when he punctures you with anger, when spitting fire, when he prays with fire, when across his face and the after image of malaise, when praying on and on you, when you look quick from the floor, when you count the tile floor and patterns of four, when he sees you, when he's drinking, when he is and you are, when for safety your mother, when where is your mother, father? Heat in the leather, bends its broken, shoe stutter, creasing. Dear, oh doe, I rest my ghost. And I feel guilty for ever remembering, for even thinking of the times my father, weakened in a field of depleted body, Mania breaks onto the page, a period, a tiny, tightly knotted blood vessel, a blooming occasion, an occasional break, an occasional rage, an occasional fist, an occasional blackout eye, an occasional spit, an occasional chase, an occasional limp, an occasional high, an occasional fracture, an occasional heat, an occasional fault, an occasional loss of sleep, an occasional cry, an occasional deal, an occasional bomb, an occasional moment to heal, an occasional shame, an occasional scream, an occasional knife, an occasional threat of life, an occasional blood, an occasional escape, an occasional dream, an occasional hide in the car, an occasional flinch, an occasional burn, an occasional fire, an occasional scar. The key is hot foundation cut into our palms. A home is where to lock. Dear, I called animal services. I called in your doe. In his little patch of prairie curled close to the hectic road. Eyes tracking me, my scent falling all around her dough. Step away, they told me. Step away. 
don't inspire abandon. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Wow. Serena, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I do want to say one more thing is that Aditi's brother helped me with so much and Aditi's family as well with making this whole manuscript. Her father and mother took me all around Bangalore to help me locate my father's childhood homes and her brother took us to um, the rainforest and taught me about cobras, which that line about cobras came from Siddhartha. So. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I feel like when we're at the church, sometimes I'm paying such deep attention to a reading that the whole light and space changes. And I felt that in your reading, it was like just my atoms were rearranged. So thank you. Um, and now we are going to hear from Divya Victor. Thank you, Kyle. It does feel like we're in a cathedral with new gods and the God of language that includes more of us and the God of breath and the gods that karma invoked, the gods of our ancestors um, that so many of us share. It's really thrilling to be here amidst these new gods <laughs> and to, to sing along with Serena in her song of this emergency. I feel very, um, grateful and very cold. I've never experienced being in a space like this in two decades of being a poet. And like Pragitha um, suggested, you know, I wish I could go back to the young poet who was always working in predominantly white spaces, performing in predominantly white spaces. I wish I could tell her that this moment would come. And um, I really, really am so grateful to Serena, Pragita, Kama, um, Aditi, Kyle, the Poetry Project, and all of you for being here. And I'm working today and speaking today from Michigan, Michigama, uh, which are the traditional and unceded lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Potawatomi, and the Ojibwe peoples. And I am proud and obliged to work um, as a guest here. I'm going to read from Curb um, first, and then I'm going to close my reading with a, an excerpt from Kamala Mackerel's extraordinary debut, Zomfam, um, which is a breath that includes so many of us, the work of so many of our, our lungs and our, our throats. Um, as some of you here know, since I was 11, various nation states have attempted to reduce me to a stack of papers to fit my existence into a form field in a series of immigration forms. The earliest memories I have as a new immigrant in the United States was my family, my grandma, my mom, my dad, sitting around a dining table in a small townhouse in Maryland, filling out visa applications and green card applications. And each of these acts I now see retroactively as collaborative literary acts created to narrate my family's existence into this country. And like most immigrants and some poets, I became very interested in composing small acts of disobedience into this paperwork. I became interested in not flattening myself into this stack of passport photos to not let a footnote dictate the arc of my story. And so I'm interested in how poetry resists, resists the basic functions of paperwork, which is to reduce, obscure, and render merely legal what remains sublime, transcendent, and eternal about our lives. And the poem I'm going to read from Curb is called petitions for an alien relative. And it's a kind of disobedient act that writes itself into a form, um, a US immigration and citizenship form called Form 130. And that form is called a petition for an alien relative. Um, and that is what many of us use 
to bring over people who are refugees, who are evacuees, who are in some ways related to us through kinship or kitship. Um, it is a way in which we can reimagine family um, outside sometimes of blood. And it has an epigraph from the USCIS form 130. Please do not include graphic photos of childbirth or intimate relations as evidence of a relationship or a marriage. First petition. It is a Thursday and no one out on this long street looks like your mother. So you go home, wrap yourself in form I-130, knit a nest, nest with a ballpoint pen, limb your ken inside a placeholder, smooth your limbs into a square to beg for a place for your first space, her. Write a name into the petition in thin, improbable syllables. No one calls her by this name in the elsewhere because they know her fish market haggle, purse tucked at the waist, sari pleats pulsing like flushed gills. No one except the men who will ask her, ma'am, can you name two national holidays and ma'am, who lived in America before the Europeans arrived? So you plan it out. Letter by letter in letters, your mouth cupped to her cataracts, ma. Just listen and answer the men who ask how she came to know you, if she intends to remain here. And sir, for how long have you known that ma was a bowl made for two, brimming beyond any border, red as the arrival of her face seven years later, a paper apparition drawn closer and closer to you by a queue unknotting at a frayed horizon in an airport when it is a Thursday and suddenly she walks through the passport photo you once stapled at the edge of a petition to anchor her womb to your migrating heart. Second petition, A. Use this form if you are a citizen or lawful permanent resident of the United States who needs to establish your relationship to an eligible relative who wishes to immigrate to the United States. Write here if you know this place as home, about a beloved whose skin you cannot live without, whose fingers know why the jasmine bushes will not flourish in your backyard in El Sobrante, why your batter sows too late, why no amount of sugar will make your tea sweet. Why your front yard is scattered with pinions. Why all mail arrives like a bird strike to the fuselage, the dotterels dawdling and then shredding the turbines. Whose letters you fold and unfold until the creases give way and you put the pieces back together on the dining table to make a map for a country made of vein and sinew, with hands pulled clean of wedding bands and raw rice, a map for a country of two. B. If you need extra space to complete any section of this petition, use the place provided in part nine. Explain here again why they wish to leave behind the stone well where they first kissed you, where the large terrapin laps the shadow and circles around the mossy rock overhanging the clutch of her eggs to circumnavigate a history of water trapped in land, where ankles graze against cotton skirts stamped again and again and again and again with laughing doves carved into wooden blocks, where an open suitcase is an undug grave, where a field of sugarcane is a bruise spreading purple through land owned by the IMF, a land free of flags yet flagging, flagging, flagging. Third petition. 
I am filing this petition for my select only one box. I am filing this petition for my spouse select only one box. I am filing this petition for my parents select only one box. I am filing this petition for my brother, sister select only one box. I am filing this petition for my child. I am filing this petition for my select only one box. I am filing this petition during the third shift at the mobile. I am filing this petition for her eyes and her tendency to leave jars open. That'll be 450, have a good one. I'm filing a petition for her eyes and her tendency to leave jars open and the way innate turning away from me. That'll be 1780, have a good one. I am filing a petition for her eyes and her tendency to leave jars open and the way innate turning away from me is a bride walking towards me, her hands veiled in a vermilion epic written with a crushed branch of henna, yep. You'll find it right next to the coffee. Yep, have a good one. I'm filing a petition for her eyes and her tendency to leave jars open. And the way a nape turning away from me is a bride walking towards me. Her hands veiled in a vermilion epic written with a crushed branch of henna, its flowers kept aside, each of the four sepals pointing in one cardinal direction. The lobes spread thin and patient, each red stamen paired and perched. The petals ovate and leaning across the cliff of the night into the gasp of the hungrier hours. During the third shift, you do not see her as I do. Between the Haribo gummies and the sour cream ruffles, fluorescent, arms akimbo, sweet burrow sweetest sparrow. And this is the last petition, or the USCIS form I-130 spring night pastoral for our alien relatives. Ma, remember when we waded into the form field and pulled pussy willow with inky palms, flicked buckeyes, into checklist boxes, swung down drop, swung on drop down menus like banyan branches, cut terraces into the small print marshes, dragged yoked highlighters through, roved through the footnotes as you roamed through unthreshed paddy. And we, yes, 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 I remember. We parceled our family into placeholders that September and huddled in the warmth of an archive set on fire. Thank you. I will close um, by and, and sort of move us towards the conversation now by, by embodying some of the language in Kama's extraordinary um, book. And um, it's a real honor to read from their book. Um, it may be a debut, but it contains within it the wisdom of so many generations, as you heard in their invocation, um, the wisdom of the elders. And it may be a first book by them, but it feels like it contains utterances that have always circulated, um, that feel in some way atemporal or eternal, like the myths that we use to keep ourselves alive. So this is um, the opening section of the piece they read, um, Your Body is an Ocean. Take a deep breath. Expand your timid lungs as wide as you can. Breathe in the salty air of the island, the humidity of Curipip, the musky fumes of Saint-Julien. Satiate your chest with the gentleness of moss, the golden chimes of hope. Inflate your belly like red, blue, yellow, green balloons rising to the sky. Kanzu, l'indépendance. Extend this breath to the deepest chambers of your body, the unknown spaces where there are stories hidden that you are yet to discover. Like the unsent letters you wrote wrapped in tender green fabric and coconut rope, 
hidden under the pile of clothes in your closet. Breathe deep and breathe out. Breathe out the amber of life. Breathe out the flame of resilience. Breathe out the heat of forbearance. Breathe out the swell of light that will guide you through nights dark and endless like the Kalapani. You are the child of survivance. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Divya. Thank you for bringing us to the word survivance. That feels like such a culmination for tonight's reading. And thank you for your work, which is just such an important and meaningful and deeply gratifying and inspiring intervention. Um, I'm so appreciative for your work. I'm so appreciative to all of the readers. Thank you for, for the offerings tonight. Um, rather than having like a formal panel discussion, um, what we're hoping I think is to, to kind of open up the Zoom. Um, we'll let folks turn their microphones on um, and we'll keep the Zoom open for maybe 15 or 20 minutes longer and, um, and just have a conversation. Um, that can be offerings of appreciation, that can be questions. Uh, if it's feeling like we need to get the conversation started, I have a question I can pose, but I'd, I'd love to hear from the readers and the audience and see if there's somewhere intuitively we might go. Um, so Maddie, if we could switch everyone's microphones on, that would be great. Looks like the performers are unmuted. Yes. Okay, Maddie says that I think if folks want to switch their microphones off, if they would like to unmute, they can at this time. Mm. Well, maybe one place that I'd love to start. Um, I loved at the beginning of your reading, Divya, you reminded us of the ways that poetry resists the basic functions of paperwork. And I feel that so strongly uh, in your work. And I'm also reminded of this line from Pragita, um, I was meant to find myself inside a metaphor, but I wasn't there. Mm. And I was thinking about all of the ways that, you know, we experience speech and language matter that governs us or that inflicts certain harm upon us. And poetry presents some sort of otherwise. And I'm wondering, you know, what kinds of otherwise you find in poetry, maybe as readers of one another's work, which was another part of this event that felt so special was the, the readings across poets. Kyle, could you say that last question again? Um, yeah, I'm wondering what sorts of um, otherwise you find in one another's work as, as readers of one another's work. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are these kinds of alternatives, alternative imaginings of language that you mm -hmm. find in, in poems? Um, you know, I, I do think that paperwork immigration paperwork, whether we had to undertake it um, in order to define ourselves to enter certain kinds of nation states or whether our families had to, it, it does place us in a merely metaphoric relationship to our own bodies and to our own presence. And, you know, to return to Pragita, you know, she has this line, um, I, I think it's in brief sequence where the speaker says something like, I, I realized that I was never the whence you know, never the kind of source or the reason um, embodied. And when I read, you know, um, my peers and elders who have gathered today, I, I feel sort of removed from my abstraction and returned to my body. And whether that's in, you know, as Aditi 
um, reflected earlier, whether that's in the way our names are articulated and pronounced and the comfort of evading a microaggression in a public space, something as simple and quotidian as that, or whether that is in the kind of deeply evocative and historical body that uh, Kamala Mackerel's work returns to me. Um, so that I'm not just this siloed alien body. I'm not someone's alien relative. <laughs> I'm someone's kid. And I think their work returns me to that. And, and Serena's work does, and Pragita's work, and Aditi's work certainly does, by returning the body right along the trade routes in Emporium and says, actually, where does that body begin? And the truth is the body doesn't begin. It has been handed down, right? And it's been rescued and it's been reclaimed. So that that would be the response, I think, Kyle, yeah. Well, Divya, that's so beautiful. I mean, I would just um, join in and, and think about, um, I've been thinking about the 90s, I guess I've been thinking about Poetry Project um, in the 90s, um, which was a different, it was a different space and it was an exciting space because it was a bohemian space. But to think about the bohemian space and the South Asian space and to bring those together and to think about what was what was absent in the 90s in publishing was the inner life and the experimentation. Um, and to have so much of that in all of the aesthetics, um, just I, I, I would love to have a conversation about what we're theorizing for ourselves. What are the things that empower us that, um, that we, that really um, nurture our confidence in thinking about our inner lives and, and, and moving away from educating the reader, which we had in the 90s and earlier, to more of a place where we brought our own personal aesthetics and our risks and our own vibrance that was so hard won and so painful um, to the table um, and, and thinking about our aesthetics that way. And, and just, I've just enjoyed all of your poetries for that, um, just for the beautiful empowerment and the complexity. I don't know, that doesn't really answer anything. <laughs> um, but just thinking with you all. Yeah, I, I love that point, Brigitte, that we are moving away from educating the reader. Um, I really appreciate it of the, of the many kinds of civil rights and activist discourses that have uh, turned us around in these last few years, this kind of, to point out the labor of educating um, a group that doesn't understand us, whether that's um, in the kind of grotesque italicization of everything that belongs to us in publishing, or whether that's something more, even more laborious. You know, today I saw um, a food writer whose name I'm forgetting now, celebrating that the word they see was no longer italicized in the New York Times. I thought, wow, these, these are victories in some ways um, at, at the level of the word and the, at the level of um, formatting. Um, and I'm so glad we're moving away from that obligation to educate. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I'll say something. I don't know if I have an answer exactly to that question, but like, you know, just as much as, uh, I, I've been thinking, talking, working even materially with salt. I think uh, one of my other obsessions, so to speak, is with tongue, like with just the word tongue uh, as a word, but also in terms of what it means as a word, like it means the muscle, right? Like the muscles that like, you know, it, that makes sound uh, amongst other things, uh, you know, but also tongue as like language, right? Like as mother tongue. There's something for me, I don't know how to frame it exactly, but there's something about, there's something about the tongue, there's something about, yeah, and in this moment in particular, like hearing each other, reading each other's work, or like, you know, like wrapping my tongue around like Dunya's poetry, and I don't know, there's, there's yeah, there's, there's something for me, just in the same way that I think about salt as like this mineral that actually we all have and connects us and you know and and there's something about tongue and that space uh, both as like language but also as like the actual tongue of poetry and the language of poetry that that creates something like there, there's something there.
there were so many moments, different moments in these readings tonight of like really ecstatic embodiment. Um, and what you're saying, Kama, is reminding me of what a transmission that is. You know, like I, I, I really, um, I don't know, I, I really felt in different ways in, in different of these readings, um, how that language is sort of bringing me into a different experience of, of body and embodiment. Yeah, I, I'm often reminded of, um, you know, Serena has spoken about um, reading be, being a kind of connection with nervous systems or like collective nervous systems. And this is actually something that we've talked about in regards to what it means to write about traumas that we don't think belong to us or traumas that are considered public. And Serena is the one who says, you know, we, the, the, nervous, the illusion of an individual nervous system cannot exist that every time we listen to someone else's language, something is happening to our bodies, right? And in that, um, in that we have a particular kind of uh, responsibility to each other, um, to, to hold each other in some ways responsible for those flickers, responses that are nervous. Um, and I, I wanted to add that, you know, Carl, to what you're saying about that collective. Are there any questions that, that folks in the audience have? I feel like there's been an active chat. And so I'm, if anyone would like to, to come forward, either in the chat or, or over microphone and Zoom, that's very much welcome. Wait, before anyone asks a question, I just wanna plant one kind of thought um, to our community and I'm, it's open-ended, but I would like to think about um, maybe just in thinking about Serena and Divya's kind of um, kind of bringing that idea of the uh, I'm going to do a terrible paraphrasing of what you just said, but but thinking about the collective suffering. I hope at some point we can have a conversation of not here, but at some point in the future, just about a poetics of collectivity that might come out of ideas we've been raised with in the South Asian community that have had no place because they've been so rigid and they've been kind of so parental, but they could, but they could be in poetry in a really kind of um, emancipatory way. Just a thought. And I think Divya and Serena, all, all, Aditi, Aditi and Kama all, you know, obviously your work embodies this, but it would be fun to think about what that poetics looks like to, to all of you. I love what you just said, Pragita, and I think you all really just also embodied that in your circular format. It was so beautiful to hear you read each other's work um, as an entry. And I think there's something in the movement of that that is like water, that is like flow and also um, partly of what I've been thinking about in terms of like outside of the box of American confessionalism and the way that that sort of circumscribes um, voices that are categorized as ethnic voices. Um, and so I think there is just something really beautiful that I experienced with the flow of you all together um, which is again, kind of, to me, I've just really been thinking about like this contrast to the sense of like an American individual or an American statement poem. Um, and what does that look like to be woven into, to be flowing into, um, to be emergent with. So thank you all so much for that. Yeah, Purvi, thank you. Um, I, I really do think it's time to revisit the role of the chorus. Um, and the chorus as a, a source not of agreement, but of, of disagreement, choruses with room for cacophony and heterogeneity and noise rather than harmony, 
I think it's time to re re-examine that um, as a place of lyric formation beyond confessionalism, beyond um, the individual. I love that, Divya. I'm just going to riff on that for a minute, too, because I think when you were talking about voice and echoing Serena, um, I was also thinking about the way how in speech, when you begin to deeply listen to people, you become in tune with them. There is a tuning that happens systemically and your pace and rhythm, your breath begins to also match other people. Um, so I think there is something deeply moving between the wound and the nervous and what is fragile and harm and also what is possible in attunement. I'm seeing the heart reactions and I'm thank you so much for for opening this conversation Brigitte. it feels like incredibly rich a, a really rich question um and a a door or an idea of how this event might kind of continue beyond the time space of this event it's really exciting to think about you know a a, a more extended conversation happening in maybe some different form. I really hope so. Yeah, this is, I think, just the beginning. You know, as, as many of us are reflected, this really feels unprecedented for us. And so I'm really looking forward to the next, the next, yeah. I'm feeling that's maybe where we should let this event have its punctuation, but we'll find a, there's a following sentence, um, which I'm really looking forward to. I'm so grateful to all of you who read. I'm really grateful to everyone who was so listen, so generous with their attention as, as listeners. The chat was just like really inspiring and special throughout. There will be a recording of this event. Um, it'll go up in probably a few days. And um, before we sign off, I just want to share what we do have coming up at the Poetry Project. So um, on this Friday, we have the first event from one of our curatorial fellows, Bryn Evans, and that's titled Homecoming Languages Capacity to Guide. And then next week, we have events with Michael Gottlieb and Joseph Kaplan, a lecture with Ann Lauterbach on Thursday the 7th. And then our next Wednesday reading will be Rosemary Waldrip and Wendy Sue. So a lot to look forward to, um, a lot to look forward to from this event. And thank you again, everybody. <laughs>